Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I hope everybody is feeling well. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Konrad Michukiewicz, and I teach on the PI program. Uh, it's a warm welcome to uh, IGP students from all three programs and IGP staff. And foremost, I'm honored to introduce to you uh, Lucia Pietrojusti, who is the head of ecologies at Serpentine London. For those of you who are new to London, uh, Serpentine are two gallery spaces in Hyde Park, Kensington Gardens, located around the Serpentine Lake. And so when you go to Hyde Park on a Sunday or on a Saturday or on a weekday, you can go and explore exhibitions at Serpentine Galleries. Um, as a curator, Lu uh, Lucia works at the intersection of art, ecology, and systems, often outside the exhibition space. She was the founder of Serpentine General Ecology Project, uh, started from uh, 2018 and ongoing, and the curator of the Golden Lion winning opera performance Sun and Sea by Rugile Bardziuk Saite, Viva Granite, and Lina Lapelite. Um, current and recent projects of Lucia include the research and festival series, The Shape of a Circle in the Mind of a Fish, uh, Person as Person, The Eighth Biennale, um, and others. Um, she teaches and lectures at universities internationally, and she leads the Interior Ecologies course at the head Gen the Geneva MA Interior uh, Architecture. A uh, recent and forthcoming publication of uh, Lucia include The Shape of a Circle in the Minds of a Fish, uh, More Than a Human, and mi Microhabitable, and Plant Sex, uh, 2019. Um, and today, uh, Lucia's talk uh, is entitled The Sacred and the System. And in this talk, she will reflect on learnings from projects, including Serpentine's General Ecology Project, the Opera Performance Sun and Sea, uh, and others, Art and Ecology. Uh, uh, and she will, uh, she will discuss possible roles that art, culture, and uh, culture organizations can play towards environmental justice and balance seeking holistic, artist-driven, and systems-led strategies for finding purpose in a time of a breakdown. Lucia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you so much. Can you hear? Is this working? You can hear me over there. <laughs> Amazing. I've just disconnected it, so I'm just going to quickly fix this. Um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to Henrietta, to you, to Velvet, for the hospitality. Thank you for having me. Um, now, it is probably the first time that I get the chance to talk and lecture within the context, within a context such as the Institute for Global Prosperity uh, series. And so um, if there's anything uh, that I'm describing to you that feels a little bit too art worldly or too sort of sector specific, then feel free to ask me uh, about it a little bit afterwards. Um, I will be uh, trying to attend to the uh, question that was set by, uh, by you guys in the uh, in setting of the series, although, of course, I think um, that the question of whether cultural institutions can be can be or are spaces of democracy is a very complex question, and I'd rather ask myself whether they can and what could they do in order to be more spaces of democracy than they are now. Uh, so I work, as Conrad said, as head of ecologies at Serpentine UK, and I wanted to start with this quote by a friend and artist, James Bridal, who has written a book called Ways of Being, uh, recently published by Penguin, which you may have come across, which is a book about um, uh, about interrogating current advanced technologies for ways in which they could be uh, designed in ways that are more just and more environmentally balanced. And so James wrote, and this was in response to a number of exhibitions that have been growing actually in London, a number of exhibitions that speak about uh, uh, environmental uh, balance, environmental breakdown, environmental justice, they might be exhibitions that um, set themselves the task to, quote, raise awareness about these issues. And James uh, put this question to uh, his follow to their followers in uh, July of uh, July of this year. It was the 20th of July of 23, saying there's no point making work about climate change. In times of crisis, the work has to work. It has to do work. 
Artistic practice should be part of the change we wish to see, practical, educational, regenerative. Now, I don't necessarily think, interpret this quote by James to mean that art always needs to be uh, activist, for example, or always needs to do something external to being art itself. But I think there's a million ways of interpreting James's prompt and James's proposition and actually provocation. And, um, and it's quite kind of comedic that I should be saying that given the fact um, you know, given the fact that that uh, James is kind of calling us to imagine a practice that goes beyond awareness raising, and yet the project that is probably most famous uh, that I have uh, ever worked on is a work that is profoundly dedicated and has a profound effect on pretty much awareness raising. So what this was, a, um, was an opera performance that we presented at the Venice Biennale. It's a work by three Lithuanian artists called Rugile Barjukaita. Um, Viva Granite and Dina La Polita. And what it is, it's an, it's an opera performance, which is sung by, uh, uh, by characters, singers, that are on this beach. And as you can see from the architecture, it's an artificially lit, artificially recreated beach in an indoor environment. And during the course of a one hour long loop, although the performance kind of goes in a loop and continues on, so when you walk in and when you walk out, it never stops. And so you have this feeling that the scene on the beach is going on kind of forever. The characters on the beach are um, who are identified by some very simple kind of adjectives in the libretto, like the complaining lady and the the volcano couple and um, the the um, workaholic man and things like this. What they do is they sing their uh, thoughts, their tiredness, their chit chat conversations, the kind of experience that you might have on holidays at the beach. Um, but in their uh, sort of monologue, inner monologues or dialogues, you start to sense over time a sense that something is just beyond view, some kind of disruption, some kind of looming um, kind of threat, some kind of danger. And then as is the case for so many of uh, those uh, humans who do not live on the front lines of climate breakdown, all these characters on the beach think about it for a second and then just let it go. And it's interesting how the interpretation of this piece has changed over time. Here you see it presented um, after its success in Venice. It actually has had a ridiculously long tour around the world. So we, I think we're now at sort of city 40. Um, and you see it presented here in an abandoned uh, taxi parking space in Vilnius in Lithuania and on the right uh, Baroque theater in Rome. And what we found is that the interpretation of this piece or the meaning, whilst the piece remains exactly the same, the interpretation or the meaning of the piece changes as we move with it and as time moves along. So uh, the original was presented in 2019 in Venice. Um, it went through the COVID pandemic. So all of a sudden, this, the fact that the beach was artificially recreated indoors had a lot of echoes around um, a sort of alienation, I suppose, and in and the 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 space that we were creating around ourselves with technologies such as Zoom, which allowed simultaneously to connect across distance in moments of lockdown, and at the same time have now imprisoned us in this hyper technology <laughs> hell that I'm sure we found ourselves all in. And um, of course, the um, the BLM protests in 2020 and the uprisings in 2020s around the world brought something to this piece as well, because it became quite obvious that the people that were on the beach or the characters on the beach were, and of course I've, my interpretation of the present uh, already betrayed this, but I don't think that we were thinking about it in the presentation in Venice at the time. But over time it became clear that these are people who are not on the front line of climate breakdown and who therefore have the privilege to be able to think about climate breakdown and then ignore it. And so questions around justice and around environmental justice became very important, particularly as we presented the piece at the Albany in, um, in uh, Deptford here in London in July of 2022. It was quite clear that presenting it in a theater like the Albany in Deptford, which has a really long history of kind of political engagement, we uh, were going to have to address questions around environmental justice that pertains not only to the, the planet, but also to the neighborhood within which we situated ourselves. Now, Deptford uh, has a long history of environmental racism. Pollution is unequally distributed across the neighborhood. And so we worked on a number of programs and public engagement uh, projects that addressed uh, the questions around environmental justice at different scales. So to a certain extent, the piece did not change. Uh, the internal kind of the text and the internal workings of the piece did not change. But what we've been trying to do over 
time has been to be sensitive to the location within which it is pr presented. I'm going back one slide because the uh, what you see on the left is an abandoned Bauhaus swimming pool um, in ex East Germany outside of Berlin. And what you see on the right, on the other hand, is a cultural center called La Moneda, which is in the center of Santiago de Chile, which we uh, were in at the beginning of this year. And uh, it's very interesting to be in the center of Santiago de Chile. The Centro Cultural de La Moneda is directly underneath the presidential palace. A number of very important um, events have happened, not least the fact that an incredibly uh, I suppose, revolutionary new constitutional proposal proposed by the current president to replace the Pinochet constitution. And that included within it so many principles around environmental justice, indigenous rights, uh, 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 and, and sort of the rights of more than humans was rejected. And it was rejected because so much of the middle class of uh, Chile is still broadly right wing and, uh, and was opposed to this new constitution. And so what we uh, uh, thought of as a small intervention, we worked with the local organizers and with, with our collaborators on the ground uh, and uh, invited a singer from the Mapuche community, who you see right in the middle of the uh, scene, to sing one particular song, which is a song where one of the sort of tourists on the beach complains that there's no more water in the bottle. And that itself was a hint at uh, the plight of many of the communities in the north of Chile who are affected by uh, intensive lithium mining extraction, which incidentally is a crucial element in um, sort of uh, extracted elements that is necessary to even the green transition. So when we talk about the green transition, most of the time we're talking an unjust transition that affects communities the world over. But uh, and so an intensive mining uh, lith lithium mining uh, uh, causes the depletion of water tables and water resources, and of course the disruption of the lives and livelihoods of plenty uh, communities. And so very, very, very small interventions. If you don't know that they're there, you might not even know uh, the piece is not sort of uh, directly addressing of issues, but what we've been trying is sort of parasitically insert a few messages. Now, uh, what I do spend most of my time doing aside from that piece is to ask myself these questions, which is what can I do and what do museums feel like they can do in relation to environmental justice and balance questions. I personally don't believe that the two major uh, answers to this question, which tend to be, well, the sector can and should reduce its carbon uh, footprint, A, and B, well, the sector and art is there to change hearts and minds or sort of explain complicated science in uh, ways that everyone can understand and so on. Uh, a friend of mine, the artist Tino Segal says, well, you know, if that's all art can do, then basically you're saying that we are the graphic designers of the catastrophe and that is not what we are. And so I ask myself this question because I myself believe that that is a sort of tip of a very large, and forgive me, iceberg. I mean, it's a terrible image to uh, pose to you in place of melting ice sheets, but it's a tip of a very large iceberg around what indeed is the role, the function, the agency, but also the self-appointed agency of art and artists and creative practitioners in the face of climate breakdown. What you see at the back is a very ugly um, sort of emergence from a workshop, just to say that I really do think about this with artists, with creative practitioners and with students a lot, and an enormous amount of kind of knowledge and learning emerges from these collective genius <laughs> moments when they happen in person. Now at Serpentine, I, I uh, used to work as a curator of live and public programs. So that is everything that happens in time, film programs, music, uh, conversations, conferences, also art performances. And in 2014, we curated together with an artist called Gustav Metzger, a um, marathon, which is a kind of like interdisciplinary, continuous long festival with everybody presenting. It's sort of TED before TED really, but more performative. Um, on the subject of extinction, because Gustav um, was uh, sort of an adamant supporter of environmental movements since the very, very early one as well, since the sort of 1960s and 70s. And that was one of the first things that we did at Serpentine that were directly addressing uh, the environment. And it wasn't until 2018, so a few years later, after having a child actually, and that was a really important kind of learning moment uh, for me. It wasn't until 2018 that I proposed to the Serpentine 
to found a project which I uh, suggested be called General Ecology, uh, the aim of which was, uh, and I suppose I've, again, like with hindsight of now, it's easier to tell you the aim, but the aim of which was to infuse a sense of environmental justice and balance throughout all of the, pro, uh, the organization's programs, infrastructures, and networks. So that was why it was called General Ecology. The idea was to <laughs> generalize ecology and ecological principles throughout an organization or sort of workings, inner workings. And the second idea was to talk and address ecology in general. So really to take it as wide, you know, when they say like, oh, it can mean everything and nothing. It was kind of intentional, intentionally uh, decided that we would call it ecology and that we would let it mean everything and nothing so that as much of our activities and, organ and sort of organizational initiatives could be, um, could start moving in a direct, in a certain direction. Of course, my agency at the time, I was a curator. Um, my agency at the time was uh, programming things and researching things and making books and making events. And so some of the emergences from that project you saw, but there was quite a lot uh, in the projects that needed to be done at, let's say, organizational wide levels. And that was not quite there in 2018. So the general ecology at Serpentine set itself the task of doing four things, nurturing and developing cultural artifacts artworks and stories so that's like kind of curate like just doing the curator's job um inviting art institutions and artists to develop a deeper sense of purpose um advocating for the role of culture and artists in environmental efforts which is what i'm doing right now and convening disciplines specialisms and efforts um sort of thinking about complex answers to complex challenges which i guess is also the purpose of the setting up of institutes such as the institute for global prosperity so working across disciplines realizing really that it's quite a sort of unregulated space, the space of cultural production and cultural organization. And that therefore there was nothing in sort of my job descriptions that told me that I couldn't use it as a space to convene uh, and kind of try and find translation points between disciplines and specialism. Something that in a lot of disciplines and specialisms, you actually don't have the resources, the space or the time to do. Now, one of the things that um, drives my work, there's a few quotes in this uh, talk. One of the things that drives my works very much is uh, this moment in uh, architect Keller Easterling's book, Medium Design, where she writes, where nothing is new and nothing is right, there are no dramatic manifestos, but maybe there is a chance to rehearse a habit of mind, I love that, that has been eclipsed. You are already able to detect, as if with half-closed eyes, a world at a different focal length. Rather than only declarations, right answers, objects and determinations, you can detect and manipulate the medium or matrix in which they are suspended and in which they change over time. And what I love about this moment is what, it, what Keller realizes in this uh, particular passage of the book is that the cultural space is no, long, no, no longer only the space in which uh, creative practitioners create objects or arts or discourse or whatever. It is also the space in which we can begin to become sensitive and sensible and sort of attuned to the space in between things, that stuff that feels like we're going through a moment in which this might be happening, or feels like we're edging towards this kind of fear or this kind of you know, new activations of new agencies or new possibilities. That feeling is the feeling that I try and identify, or at least, um, what's the word, conjure like a witch. Uh, in the stuff that I uh, do. And then the other uh, driving principles that uh, that sort of drives quite a lot of my research is encapsulated so well in this beautiful book of Amitav Ghosh called The Nutmeg's Curse, where he writes, if non-human voices are to be restored to their proper place, then it must be in the first instance through the medium of stories. The eradication of knowledge forms, the violent, in fact, eradication of knowledge forms, which consider the earth to be a living, intelligent, entity with consciousness and consider every living things and actually also mineral uh, mountains as well and non-living things to be to have agency to have rights to have consciousness to have intelligence and to have will those are the stories that have been eradicated from the sort of dominant western perspective that governs so much of of uh, of actually the systems of today and those are the kinds of uh, re uh, revitalism revitalization, Amit of course speaks about vitalism, um, that can potentially be seeded through the medium of art and culture, at least I hope so. Now, in 2020, Serpentine was looking at um, 
was looking at celebrating 50 years of its existence as a contemporary art organization. And uh, we, if this was, we were planning it, of course, in 2019. So COVID was not yet visible to us or anyone. And, um, and what we thought is, well, given the fact that we have this ecology project, um, and given, let me, <laughs> uh, given the fact that we have this kind of long ecology project and this vast network of organizations, cultural organizations, but also very much not research organizations, environmental advocacy ones, artists, practitioners, all these people that we've spent all these years working with. Why don't we use the chat, the occasion of the um, uh, anniversary of the Serpentine rather than celebrating 50 years backwards to try and, and the words were take responsibility for 50 years in the future, and then actually kind of reflect and meditate on what it would be like to take responsibility over 500 years in the future, 5,000 years in the future, go wild. And so what we, what we uh, thought was we would invite 50 artists, we had ended up inviting 64, but that's <laughs> just by accident, and uh, to propose things that were simultaneously, the brief was simultaneously a, a artwork and an environmental campaign, prototype, intervention, collaboration. We had lots of words to sort of expand the semantic possibilities of the work. And we received such different uh, proposals. And uh, over the course of the next few years, the project went on from 2020 to 2020 to the end of 22, and now has morphed into something else, but you know, continues. We um, took uh, some of those campaigns. Uh, we had a big ambition to realize them all and then realized that all of them were these kind of really long-term commitments um, uh, for, the, for, for us, for the organization. So some of them became a sort of long, longer-term project. Uh, and some of them remain as, let's say, sort of uh, data points or I suppose study material around what sort of artists believe their agency might be uh, in on the planet. Now, here are four examples of projects that I often uh, refer to because of the fact that they illustrate quite well the kinds of vectors that we identified by looking at the sort of ensemble of all of these uh, projects and programs. And I'm going to just describe them a little bit for you. Places were all the projects in which artists said, well, you know, okay, well, I've got my artistic practice, but I'm also nurturing a place, a real space somewhere in the world. And I would like uh, your organization to somehow lend this kind of support. And it was very different support, uh, sort of harnessing public funding and public support uh, or funding directly. Building, I built some websites for, for some organizations, um, but also skills exchanges, places of uh, places in which our networks might perhaps be put to the to sort of service of, of particular locations, such as a center for the arts and sciences of the body, the earth, and the sky, led by Tabitha Hezeh in the forest of French Guiana. Speculations works which, you know, what you imagine artworks to be a little bit more like, works that think about alternative futures, alternative origins, such as this gorgeous installation, immersive installation by um, Robert L. Cohen and Torvald Ballen, which we presented in London in, in October of 21. Uh, which sort of took the intelligence of the octopus as a sort of departure point to think about an alternative origin for humans on Earth and the idea of interplanetary ecology, so speculative. And systems like the work of cooking sections, an artist duo that looks at replacing um, energy intensive and very uh, damaging, environmentally damaging forms of, uh, forms of food production with regenerative ones. So what you see here is oyster tables as part of a longer prototype of the Isle of Skye which looks at replacing farmed salmon, which is the main kind of economic activity of the island of the sky, but all the farmed salmon is or owned by multinational corporations uh, external to the Isle of Skye, with a sort of uh, system of regenerative aquaculture. But of course, doing that pivoting from salmon farming to aquaculture is not enough to sustain an economy, unless, of course, the restaurants are starting to change their menu accordingly, and the chefs are learning to uh, kind of cook with different ingredients and so on. And so cooking sections have worked um, with our restaurant uh, providers, restaurant suppliers, Benudo, to replace the farm salmons with uh, climate dishes, which are dishes that use more sort of regenerative agriculture and aquaculture principles. 
and that have a beneficial effect on the environment. They have a whole circular system whereby the shells from the oysters and the mussels become terrazzo flooring and construction and so on. It goes on and on. And Verugo, of course, caters for the restaurant at the Serpentine, but it also caters for more most uh, cultural institutions around London and the UK. And so climate dishes and the replacement of farm salmon has been slowly taking over restaurants from the VNA to the Barbican and a number of other groups. Um, and then publics, which are sort of public awareness, I suppose those are the public awareness campaigns, you know, like Yoko Ono uh, working with a poster company to have I Love You Earth all over uh, posters in the UK. Now, here's uh, to almost conclude. Here is a brief table from our uh, strategy for ecologies of the next three years, which is really supposed to be roughly illustrative for you of the way that cultural spaces need to transform in order to attend to the different ways that art can uh, sort of affect and influence, uh, affect positive, uh, positive, positive effects on, oh, that was a terrible thing. Where, the way that art can positively contribute to environmental justice and balance, there we go. Um, so if we're thinking about art as a bridge across disciplinary boundaries, then cultural spaces have to start to think of themselves as conveners. Now, experiencing is a really tough one to talk about. Um, there are in this increasingly depleted environment, for example, in the UK, after 20 years of conservative government that has stripped society of all of its cultural support systems, cultural support networks, organizations and institutions whose role it is to hold and to shelter. How can cultural spaces start to think of themselves as potential holders for those kinds of incredibly difficult things to face? Um, that are, you know, being faced by so many today in terms of climate breakdown, how, and so on and so forth. I'm going to skip very quickly. Um, the main research questions that we have for the next three years are mind and consciousness on this planet, the agency of the role and responsibility of art and culture in the environmental emergency, and then how cultural institutions um, need to transform in order to attend to those needs. So basically everything I've been talking about um, right now. Now, I will conclude with this. When... In the face of environmental breakdown, and in part because we are actually planet as opposed to separate from planet, um, the way that we talk about metaphors, the, the relationship between metaphor and the ontological reality of the thing that the metaphor is extracted from just collapses. So in environmental collapse, metaphors collapse. What I mean by that is that at the same time as the earth is burning, people on this earth are burning out in alienation. <laughs> monoculture has the same devastating effect as monoculture, taken literally and metaphorically. Now, how do we start to attend to this is one of the key questions that I ask myself. How can the art institution be a literal space of a sanctuary and a metaphorical sanctuary, sanctuary for ideas and a sanctuary for people? How can we start to understand human effects, human emergencies and human, uh, let's say, um, cultures as very much part of planetary um, emergencies and culture. And here's one of my greatest guiding lights, a beautiful and conclude, concluding quote from Ursula Le Guin in which she writes very poignantly for right now, prior to the preeminence of sticks, swords, and the hero's killing tool, our ancestor's greatest invention was the container, the basket of wild oats, the medicine bundle, the net made of your own hair, the home, the shrine, the place that contains whatever is sacred, the recipient, the holder, the story, the bag of stars. Now, I do not know, I genuinely do not, if cultural, no, if cultural spaces and creative practice can be the site of democracy today. What I do believe, however, is that it is potentially, if it, does, if it plays its cards right, the place that it is potentially the place that these days can nurture um, the net made of your own hair, the medicine bundle, the story, the bag of stars, and the place that contains whatever is sacred. I think that this is the job that we do um, in the arts, or at least uh, that I would love to spend more time doing. And that's about everything I have to tell you. Thank you. Uh, Lucia, thank you so much for this fascinating uh, talk. Before we uh, get some questions from the audience, I would like to start by asking you to explore and expand a little bit more uh, on these relationships between arts and uh, research. So, so you mentioned that the um, arts and, and research 
try to address together the uh, climate change uh, in a transdisciplinary way. What are the new opportunities emerging within that long-standing relationship between arts and research? What 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 are the opportunities emerging specifically from the uh, from the from the reflection on the uh, on the environmental crisis. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I might actually go back to a slide that I was gonna <coughs> skip, which is the methodologies that we're using for the next three years. Now, the basically what we're doing is we're taking general ecology and we're taking back to earth and everything that I've been talking about and we're bunching it all into ecology. The bit that I forgot to mention is that this new role, head of ecologies, which I wrote for myself, is the role that has the agency to do the things that I wanted the general ecology project to do and I didn't have the agency to do. So working with every single department, every single individual, every single project across the entire organization to think about ways to implement environmental principles into the, into the kind of protocol for how to do things. Um, which means that kind of by definition, the ecology strand is going to be a strand that, look, that goes between research and practice, praxis and creative practice. Um, uh, alter, al alternatively and constantly. And so what we're sort of using as a methodology is something that I don't think, I don't know if it has a name, but we're calling it a kind of open research principle. That is to say that whilst the research strand and you know, including collaboration with, uh, with research institutions and higher education institutions, of course, as that uh, evolves and, and continues uh, sort of in a closed door way or in a embedded way, we are also doing um, sort of launching commissions and programs and public events, not as outcomes at the end of a research process, but actually as um, ongoing experiments. So an example for that is we have a festival called the Infinite Ecologies Marathon coming up in July of 24. And normally what we do when we prepare to a fest with a festival like this is we have sessions with advisors in which we sort of ask, we sense the temperature and we kind of ask them where we you know, where they and we sort of, we discuss where we think we should go. What we decided to do this year instead is, is was to let, lead a kind of open doors public prelude event. Uh, that happened three weeks ago, where we opened up the our sort of temporary, temporary architectural structure outside the Serpentine, the pavilion. And we invited a number of practitioners to think with us about A, what was underrepresented on the environmental agenda, and B, what was not yet on the agenda, but would be in the near future. So the idea was to set the agenda for the festival of next year by having uh, a kind of conversation that included our audiences in, in that. Now, one of the most important things that we learned in that, and this is really goes to the heart of uh, the research needing to be responsive to actually what happens in those encounters. What we learned the most about that is that a lot of environmental sort of movements and practitioners are very tired and to a certain extent quite demoralized and sometimes even very out of tune and out of touch with what is actually going on and that was to and that perhaps there was something wrong with the medium of presentation <coughs> that also did not allow for things that perhaps might be more healing in today's times things like singing and performance and ritual and togetherness and food and conviviality we needed more of that and less Sort of slogan and and we really felt it you know it was the 14th of october so we really felt it like very very presently and there was a great discomfort that came out and as a result of that we very quickly made the decision of changing the format of the festival that is going to be next year completely so instead of most likely this is very new news but instead of being a 24-hour festival very expensive very bombastic happening all at once and so on we're probably going to split those 24 hours into 24 days. And so it will be a much slower festival catering to you know, different ages of audiences every day and sort of really taking our time and to a certain extent experiencing, sort of trying to care a little bit better and in a different way for our audiences. Now that's a medium specific kind mm -hmm. of um, point, but uh, it goes to the heart of the ways in which we see research in that, in that sense, that commissions and artist projects don't necessarily always have to be the end point. Yeah, but they can be the beginning point for the next phase of something. So it's necessarily a very long process. This three-year strategy of three years that are supposed to sort of set the scene for the next four-year strategy after that. So it's like never going to end. But um, but yes, so I don't know if I answered your question. I, I think you did very well. Uh, now and now we have some time for questions from the audience. 
I see one question here and one question there. So maybe we'll start from the front row, Chris. Ah. Thank you so much for that talk. It was wonderful. Stand very still. <laughs> um, what I was curious to hear you talk more about, I, I kind of picked up on the word sacred in your title, which obviously is a very complex word, and I don't want to kind of unpack all its meanings, but one association with this association is with belief systems or, or things to do with belief, let's say. It's very crude, of course. Um, so you, you mentioned knowledges, sensations, affects. I was curious to hear, and, and you started to talk, I think, a bit about it in your answer to Conrad, like the role of art in relation to belief systems generally, but also specifically like the, the maybe this is a personal opinion, the challenge to believe in a better future right now because of the catastrophes we witness on it almost feel, feels like a daily basis. Thank you, that's a beautiful question. Um, the first thing that I'm going to say is that there is something, that, what I love about my job is that I'm a specialist in <laughs> is the professional amateur, is that me? <laughs> is it kind of professionally an amateur about things? So even the use of terminology is quite, I'm going to say purposefully imprecise, just not to seem like a total ignorant. <laughs> no, that must be me. I'm muted. Okay, so it's not me. So it's probably. Is that me? Was that me? <laughs> oh dear. Okay, let's try again. Um. So, so that was sort of my apology to begin with. But the the reflection on the sacred is a fairly new one me and it's one that I'm starting to insert in talks these days in order to have a better relationship in order to actually have this kind of conversation and to develop the project further now the intuition is there was we were prompted by the filmmaker Mantia Diawara this weekend who answered the question of what was underrepresented on the environmental agenda by asking another question which is what could the sacred be like today what would be the what would be the meaning of the sacred today? Now the intuition, I suppose, is that uh, so many institutions of that hold ritual in contemporary in the contemporary world don't exist anymore, and that potentially the the art sort of environment or the art space or the art experience even might be what's left in this very very kind of de-ritualized society, particularly like the Anglo world, even more than Southern Mediterranean, come from Italy. So there's quite a lot of rituals left at, around the top table and dinner table and you take care of your elders and all this kind of stuff. But so it, it, it that over time it sort of changes. And all of a sudden you've got religion on one side, which is incredibly politicized. And then like lay society, whatever that means, could capitalism on the other side, which is incredibly, non-ritual and nothing kind of left in the middle and so it was it's it's that's one point which has to do with just like the absence of togetherness ritual and hyper reliance on things like also language not statement making where do you stand on this but i'm going to interpret your words to mean that and then all of a sudden you've got this massive polarization and it's all this like sitting around with language only as the medium through which to communicate when there are so many others that could bring us together in a different kind of us, that could bring individuals and communities together in, in, a, in a different way. That is not this hellscape of social media. So there's also a little bit of this. Um, now, someone like Brian Eno, who has been working on environmental questions for a really long time, uh, would take it in a different direction. He would say something like, and I think it's really valid, he would say something like, you know, no, nobody ever makes decisions when they vote on the basis of objective data. Most of the time they make it on the basis of feeling. Actually, Kumi Naidu, a fantastic human rights advocate, says the same thing. Basically says the right has learned really well how to appeal to feeling, and the left is just not yet as good. And so how to, how, how to sort of also, I mean, you know, and this is not to say that the culture is on the left, whatever, but 
how to sort of counter propose forms of environmental justice and balance that also appeal to the senses and to the emotions and to and to the embodied and to the, the enfleshed sense of belonging to this planet and having a relationship to it. Now, when it comes to the question of daring to have belief in the future, it's a super complex and, and uh, a question also most probably because because that answer depends very largely on who you are and where, uh, and will always do. And I think we kid ourselves when we give a sort of generic sense of hope. I mean, I, this is something that I'm very sensitive to and find very irritating actually. Um, exhibitions that talk about hope and optimism or nihilism or grief or all of those things. Those things are so sort of varied and variable according to positionality and situated knowledge. And, and anyways, they all happen at the same time. Like this is, the planet is like inherently simultaneous contradiction just stacked on top of one another. That um, what I'm most, most, much more partial to is the, um, uh, the, the exhortation or the invitation that is made by practitioners like Donna Haraway in Staying with the Trouble or Vanessa Machado de Oliveira, fantastic, um, fantastic book called Hospicing Modernity, in which she talks about facing as a sort of perhaps even counterpoint to the optimism, pessimism, hope um, sort of bit. And facing is a much is a very di different thing. She talks about hospicing as well. She's, the book Hospicing Modernity is um, she described it as a book that is about letting, allowing colonial modernity to die around us and inside of us with humility and grace, to allow for space for the greater metabolism, that is to say the planet and all of its living beings, to strengthen their tether to us. And so she uh, works on metaphors of palliative care and hospicing in order to, but not grief, not like despondency, uh, to sort of uh, allow for a number of interior exercises also to sort of um, face breakdown um, differently. And she's very specific to writing this book for people in low intensity struggles as opposed to high intensity struggles. So she's also very clear about who the book is for and why. Um, that would be a position that I would personally align myself with. Now, of course, when you're presenting these kinds of things to your organizational um, uh, colleagues, you have to say things like solutions that I hate. <laughs> so you have to sort of present something that, that is uh, more, I suppose, you can't, I, I couldn't present a project that talks about hospicing, uh, but I think the secret, the sort of shadow aim is, is to also work a little bit on those feelings from the sacred to the, and in fact, the, the longer title for this talk was The Sacred, the System and the Place of Shelter. Um, which I changed last minute for whatever reason. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lucia. Now we have one more question at the back, Nikolai. Thank you. I can... uh, thanks for that. I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit on this point uh, about metaphor that you made towards the end of your talk. So you mentioned that metaphor becomes obsolete in times of environmental crisis. And I suppose the way I understand that point is that here metaphor itself becomes a metaphor for the gap between humans and nature. And not right. because of the environmental crisis, we'll have to rethink this relationship, right? So between metaphorical terms, there's a kind of tension between identity and difference. And there's a sort of similar kinds of tension in the relationship between humans and nature, which in times of environmental crisis is sort of collapsing and becoming one. So. I have, I suppose, a couple of questions um, about what happens under these conditions of collapsing metaphor. The first is, what happens with human agency and what is the new role of the human agent? And the other is, how are we to deal with this history of the metaphor uh, and the, the sort of, um, you know, the, the, the legacy of the enlightenment subject who is in control of nature? under these conditions of environmental collapse and metaphorical collapse? Well, thank you. It's an incredibly complex question and I'm going to answer it in the most romantic possible of ways. So forgive me <laughs> for having no protocol to attach to, to, to this. Uh, to this. Um, I, th I think, I mean, it's a very, it's a, 
you've put it in a better play, way that I could put it in terms of this intuition about the collapse of metaphor and, and I suppose literal. Um, my, my feeling was less perhaps the obsolescence of the metaphor, but more the teaching of what this, I suppose, original relationship that the metaphor had with the planet may have been. Like, what can it teach? If we look at a metaphor, what can it teach us about the planet itself? Um, and I guess that's a partial answer to the two questions that you've put, one of them being the, the agency and the legacy of, of, let's say, let's call it enlightenment thinking. Um, to a certain extent, I, I'm going to also quote uh, 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 Brian, you know, quoting a, a Russian historian from the beginning of the 20th century. Anyway, long back story to this saying, I would, I mean, and I don't know if I necessarily agree, but he said something that sort of piqued my interest, something along the lines of a revolution happens not only when everybody wa wants change, but when everybody realizes that everybody else wants it as well. So that this agency is a, the sort of two part like taking agency as a two-part step before the taking of agency there is the realization of a certain there's a kind of reckon, reckoning of realization and i think to a certain extent this practice of somehow like unbuilding the metaphors for how they have ended up so separate from the world but how they can teach us back about, about the world is kind of a is a is a very useful practice for reintroducing a notion of in this context in which you're constantly like you know i go around the lecturing about being part of the planet but i don't live like part of the planet no so many people don't we can't it's impossible the systems that govern today's world make us complicit into a, a perennial separation from planetary responsibility let alone just and so but but again in terms of sacred or ritual practice it is a really helpful practice to kind of continue to remind oneself and i say it only in order to sort of prompt and provoke practitioners, you guys, like creative practitioners, scientists, whatever, to sort of think to, to, you know, to interpret that in whatever terms you kind of want. So it's really just the provocation for now, but I'm really interested in the points that you've made because I think there's something to sort of be dug there more. Thanks so much, Lucia. And before we need to vacate these premises, which will be in three minutes, and we have the time for the very last question, and maybe a question that would come from a student. <laughs> yes, we have a question back there. I thought it was just too far away, the microphone. Uh, all the dynamics that you mentioned kind of also, I don't know how to explain this. Like, you know, I've like, whenever there's a soundbite, whenever there's a, you know, a director seminar, I just like think about my own country and like what it means for my own country. And to be honest, arts in my country, I come from Turkey, is very much robbed from the commons uh, and is very much like, I don't know, like centralized around like, um, the upper classes basically so it's like all these dynamics that you're talking about are also creating this as well like robbing of art from people so how do we actually embed that back and like give people the voice they need the artistic voice they need because otherwise all of these you know like socio-ecological uh, problems and then how they could be uh, overcome by art kind of again still um, get centralized around those groups and it just becomes like a talking point rather than an actual yeah I guess action. I couldn't agree more and I thank you so much for bringing that perspective because of course what I should have caveated all of this from is that this perspective all comes from the, from working in a contemporary art organization in London that has certain agencies and privileges as well. Um, but that doesn't necessarily have, you know, so fulfill all of those uh, those imperatives, actually, that you're talking about. And in fact, it's a conversation that I have with a lot of people that I think cultural institutions and museums, you know, under this banner of trying to bring people to the museum, all they end up doing is actually just make statements about what, you know, it's like make generalist populist statements about what people are expecting to find then in the museum and then people go in i was thinking this forgive, forgive me because i actually love the tape but i was thinking this at the tape because you arrive and it says see great art from around the world at the top and i was like if i was like a tourist that didn't know and didn't hear much about art whatever if i was you know anyone who's not a practitioner professional 
And I saw that, I was like, oh, I'm just going to go in. And then how much would I feel sort of betrayed by that promise from so much, you know, art that actually is not at all designed to be read and legible to everyone that fits completely within a very isolated and quite elitist framework. Um, I have two points of discussion around that. I agree with you absolutely. I think that the important, uh, again, the thing about that is to be conscious and to be aware of where one sits and why and what can one do from there. I don't personally think that an organization like mine is ever going to be as sort of wide open as it promises itself, as all cultural organizations promise themselves to be. But in that case, then it needs to become very strategic about what its points of agency are and in what way it can sort of influence certain things. And I mean it very, very literally, like if an artist wants to change curriculum or some something in policy, then we need to not only just make a show about it, but actually look at who funds us, who uh, you know is on our board. Can anyone influence? Can anyone make a phone? You know, to really think about systems change by not only working within the organization, but working with the organization as a medium itself. And I agree that the art organizations gather so many, you know, people with influence because of the fact that art is has a certain kind of art has been is sort of being reified in that way. And so I think that that needs to be used, actually. That's one point. The second point that I want to make is that there are co even colleagues of mine that have worked for decades in the space of um, sort of social justice and social change, and whose work I admire profoundly, including colleagues you know, within my organization, and whose work was systemically under uh, funded, undervalued, and underappreciated. And I don't work, I, you know, very often get asked the question, one of them is like, is this institutional critique? And the other one is like, is this social, um, social, or um, oh, what's the word? I'm missing the word. You see, this is how much I'm not a practitioner of this. And and I say, no, no, it really does not try and, work and take over the, this is like, the work that I do is primarily on the organizational ecology and systems change uh, side. Um, so it's a very underwhelming answer to your question, but what I mean is like, no, I think it's true. And I think once you realize very consciously that that's where it is, then what do you, what can you do from there? And perhaps that then starts to like, but the la the worst for me is pretending like it's for everybody and all of this when it's just really clearly not. Like I would feel very betrayed. If I <laughs> thank you so, thank you so much Lucia and uh, let me uh, let me join me for the last round of applause thank you for also giving your lunch.